Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for my top 10 comic books of the week. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is my top 10 comic books of the week. So out of everything that came out, and there was a plethora of amazing comic books this new comic book day, these are the 10 that I would like to spotlight as my favorite and recommendations to you. So without much further ado, my top 10 comic books of the week. At number 10, we have The Dollhouse Family, number 4, from DC Black Label and Hill House Comics. Written by M.R. Carey, with artwork by Peter Gross and Vince Locke, coloring by Chris Peter, lettering by Todd Klein. The Dollhouse Family has been one of the standout hits of Hill House Comics for me. Joe Hill's own little um, imprint within DC Black Label, where he's able to curate and write and create some of his his own work as well, some fantastic comic books, horror comic books. My favorite out of all of them is The Dollhouse Family. Issue 4 continues this tradition. I really like this book. It's generational. It's really creepy. It's got a very old school vertigo type feel to it, aided by the masterful lettering of Todd Klein. And then you got the artwork by Gross and Locke and company. Absolutely fantastic. It feels Victorian, but yet it still feels modern. It's got a great sense of suspense and tension and mystery, and it builds it up with elegant character work. Fantastic stuff by Carrie. Really like this book. To me, the standout of Hill House Comics and one of the standouts of DC Black Label. At number 9, we have Go Go Power Rangers, number 29. Written by Ryan Parrott and Cena Grace with artwork by Francisco Martino from Boom Studios. So for the last few weeks, hell, you've heard me talk so much about the Power Rangers books. Well, yet again, let me tell you that one of the best superhero comic books on shelves right now consistently is the Power Ranger books, whether it's Mighty Morphin or Go Go. Go Go is a little bit further behind in the timeline than Mighty Morphin, so right now we're dealing with Tommy Oliver's first days as the White Ranger, and it's the character work that really makes it stand out. Now, the artwork is really fire as well. Highly kinetic, very charged and dynamic, great sense of action and exciting pace to it. The writing, though, top-notch. Seriously, some of the best characterizations of these characters that have ever been done, whether on page or screen. Fantastic work from Parrot and Grace. They do a great job. And like I said, that artwork, really dynamic, really fluid, so much fun. If you like superhero comic books, even if you're an old school Power Rangers fan or not, you definitely should check out this book. And if you're a Power Ranger fan in the slightest, it's a must read. At number eight is X-Force number seven from Marvel Comics, written by Benjamin Percy with artwork by Oscar Balzadua, Guru FX on the coloring. X-Force has been one of the standout Dawn of X books. I've really been enjoying it. I think X-Men and X-Force are the necessary books, and me personally, also really liking Marauders as well, and Excalibur's kind of creeping up, kind of becoming a kind of an essential read for me. But X-Force has been fun and great ever since the first issue, whether it's the dynamic artwork that we usually get. In this one, it's a different artist, but it still works, still has a nice flow of story. But in this one, they kind of take the step back, focus a little bit on some character work with Domino. Domino's gone through a lot of changes in these last six issues of X-Force, and issue number seven really does start to address that. And it also sets up an interesting mystery and also has some great stuff involving Colossus. So what's been a really fun, action-oriented, wow shock factor type book and it's excellent for that x-force has been but now you t pull it back just a little bit and you do some great character work some nuanced work stuff that's been building up over the previous six issues and really kind kind of comes to fruition in issue number seven it's a great character study of domino some great character work with colossus and setting up an interesting mystery about what is coming up against krakoa Great stuff. If you're loving the X-Men books, if you like Hickman's direction, X-Force, a must read. At number seven, we have Ascender, number nine, from Image Comics, written by Jeff Lemire, with artwork by Dustin Nguyen. Ascender's just been a fantastic comic book, and it really, really just solidifies that yet again with issue number nine. This book is kind of an origin story of Mother, uh, the villainous character that we were introduced to in the early issues. This is kind of a sequel to Descender, but you don't have to have read Descender to read Ascender, but I would recommend it. Books are amazing. Jeff Lemire can do no wrong right now, just doing amazing work no matter what he's writing. And Dustin Wen, oh my God, what a beautiful, delicate style that he has. Those beautiful watercolors, um, great line work. It's ethereal, it's mystical, it's mythical, and it's amazing. Ascender's been great. You gotta 
focus, like I said, in on a villain. A lot of explaining gets done in this issue, but it does it in a very sophisticated way. Ascender and Descender before it have always been a very sophisticated comic book, and I absolutely love it. And it's made a flawless journey from sci-fi epic to mystical, mythical fantasy piece. At number six, we've got The Green Lantern, season two, number one, from DC Comics, written by Grant Morrison, with artwork by Liam Sharp and coloring by Steve Olaf. So frequently I've said when we were talking about season one of The Green Lantern, we're talking about comic book veterans that are pumping out exciting, um, challenging work as if they were in their 20s. That continues on with season two. Even if you didn't read what came before in season one or Black Stars or anything like that, you can jump in right here. But I'm going to warn you, Grant Morrison and Liam Sharp and company are telling a very weird, wacky, wild Green Lantern story that's not your usual fare. It feels more like a British 2000 AD type comic book, but it's great. It's filled with ideas. Ideas. It's filled with amazing artwork and composition and layouts and the coloring by Olaf are just absolutely fantastic. This has been a super fun ride. This second run is only going to be eight issues. I blame 5G, but don't worry. We'll see what happens. But Grant Morrison setting a lot up for what's going to happen in season two and maybe even laying some seeds and hints and clues about the upcoming crisis event at DC, which we now know as Death Metal. <laughs> anyway, really fun stuff. If you're a Morrison fan, it's kind of a must read. If you're a GL fan, it may not be what you're typically used to, but have the patience, reread it, stick it through. That's the best way to read Morrison. He's a challenging writer, but this is actually one of his lighter fares as far as his books go, but it's got great ideas and a great characterization of Hal Jordan that I'm really coming around on. At number five, we have Batman, Pennyworth, R.I.P., written by James Tiny IV and Peter J. Tomasi, with artwork by Eddie Barrows, Eber Ferreira, Chris Burnham, and a whole slew of others. This Pennyworth one-shot from DC Comics may be a couple months late, but now that Alfred is dead, this is a nice kind of moment to kind of reflect and, 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 and let that sink in. The idea of Batman's world, a Bat family, a Gotham City without Alfred, right? So this is basically the wake, the private wake, I should say, of Alfred Pennyworth. So you got Bruce Wayne, you got Damian Wayne, you got... Rick Grayson, because it hasn't quite caught up to him becoming Dick Grayson again, and so it's a little bit weird, and maybe they shouldn't have done that, but maybe, whatever, it doesn't matter. You got Jason Todd, you got Barbara Gordon, you got Tim Drake. So all the Robins, and Batgirl, and Batman are gathering together to celebrate the life and legacy and love of Alfred Pennyworth. So this is a great issue, very well done by Tinian and Tomasi, the current Bat writers on Detective Comics and Batman, doing a great job with this one. Each Robin and Batgirl, they have their own story about what Alfred meant to them, and it kind of reflects what he should and what he does represent to Bruce. It's a great moment, really gets into the characterizations. Like I said, this probably should have come a couple months ago. We know now that Tom King, for a fact, did not intend to keep Alfred dead. He was actually planning on revealing that he wasn't dead very quickly. DC Editorial stepped in, and now Tiny and Tomasi kind of have to pick up that pace and clean up the, the mess that was left dangling out of that quick editorial change. However, this was a great issue, really good, and it really focused in on the character of Alfred, and I really miss him. And I'm very excited, though, that he's still being utilized right now in Batman's Grave, which also came out this week. Didn't make top 10, definitely would have made top 15. Um, anyway, this Batman Pennyworth one-shot, well worth it. You know, usually these one-shots, they don't really tie in, and this didn't tie in too much, but it's a great celebration of Alfred, and it really helps you as a reader get caught up and feel the impact that this death has on the Bat family. At number four, we've got Thor, number three, written by Donny Cates, with artwork by Nick Klein, coloring by Matt Wilson. Man, Donny Cates has been just tearing up on Thor. Fantastic stuff. Big, explosive, outrageous superhero action. So in this current issue, in this current story, Donny Cates has given Thor even more powers. He's now the Herald of Galactus. There's this crazy thing coming called the Black Winter. It's what ended the last universe. Galactus was the sole survivor. Now it's back again. Galactus has given his cosmic level power to Thor, who already had some cosmic level power. Now he's crazy. He's out there with Galactus trying to find certain worlds that he can consume to pump up his energy hopefully enough to take on the Black Winter, but of course the rest of the Marvel Universe isn't going to see Thor's actions as quite sincere or understandable, right? So the first confrontation he really has is with Beta Ray Bill, so a lot of this issue is this Galactus Herald of Thunder Thor versus Beta Ray Bill. Really fun stuff, explosive comic book action, and I really love it. Donny Cates has a passion for Thor, and it really comes across in these pages. Aided by Nick Klein and Matt Wilson's artwork, Matt Wilson's been coloring Thor for the last several years, so he's no stranger to it, and he does an excellent job as always. Nick Klein, though, really stepping in as the Thor ongoing artist. Really like 
like the weight of his pencils, really like the, the great epic and grandiose nature of his composition and layouts. Fantastic stuff. Thor, three issues in, has become one of Marvel's best books. At number three, we have X-Men. Number six, written by Jonathan Hickman, with artwork by Matteo Bufagni and Sonny Gao on the coloring. This is one of the best issues of X-Men by Hickman yet. I was really kind of put off by the nature of this X-Men book early on. I was like, oh, he's slowing it up. House of X, Powers of Ten, they were so big, they were so epic, they were so game-changing. To see him kind of step back in the pages of X-Men and just kind of tell these one-and-done stories kind of threw me off at first. Then you realize he's just setting seeds. He's planting seeds that are about to blossom up into what's coming up in X-Men over the next year or two. Fantastic stuff, and I love it. This one directly ties in to previous stuff, like in House of X. Gets in onto the character of Mystique. You know that she wants to bring Des Destiny back. We know that Xavier and Magneto are kind of just leading her on a little bit about that. Maybe they don't really have an intention to bring her back. A great issue that really explores not just the current state of Mystique, but also her past. Some exciting, great revelations, great artwork, and a great story. What Hickman's doing is he's taking the opportunity to tell these one-shot stories, but they are overall setting up so much that's to come. You really get it here in X-Men number six, a very well-crafted issue in the X-Men manner, one of the best X-Men comics in recent years for me. At number two, we have Undone by Blood, or The Shadow of a Wanted Man. Number one, from Aftershock Comics, written by Lonnie Nadler and Zach Thompson, with artwork by Sammy Cavella, Jason Wordy on the coloring, Hassan Otsman El Hal on the lettering. Undone by Blood probably has an like the absolute best creative team on shelves right now. It's an all-star pitch perfect team. It's a modern day revenge western. It's very great, very enticing. I loved it so much. This was great. Nadler and Thompson are a great writing duo. They do great work together. This definitely has their definitive style, but it also feels fresh. It feels new. It feels different. You see these westerns all the time. Revenge westerns. They're, they're a dime a dozen. Modern revenge westerns. Well, they're like a nickel a dozen, right? But this one is very well done. I really like it. It's establishing the world, the context, the characters, and the, the story very efficiently, very well. Showing, not telling, but doing a little bit of telling. I really like it. It also has this other story. Um, it's a more traditional Western story that's in it. That's a piece of fiction in the world of Undone by Blood or The Shadow of a Wanted Man. And they kind of thematically relate to one another. Think a little bit like Tales of the Black Freighter from The Watchmen, right? So it's a little bit like that. It's a very nuanced, sophisticated approach, and I really did like it. It was a great first issue. Cavella's artwork was astounding. You add in that gritty, textured coloring of Jason Wordy and Hassan Osman El Hal, not only one of the greatest letterers in comic books right now, but a fantastic comic book YouTuber in and of his own right. Check out his, uh, his channel, Strip Panel Naked. Fantastic look at the technique and craft of comic books. This book is done masterfully by people who really care about the medium, really care about um, sequential storytelling and comic books, and it really oozes out that page. This one's great. If you like grim and gritty modern revenge westerns, and who doesn't? Check this one out. And at number one, Alienated, number one, from Boom Studios, written by Simon Spurrier, with illustrations by Chris Wildgoose, coloring by Andre May, and lettering by Jim Campbell. Alienated made my pick of the week, like a lot of other recent Boom Studios debuts, because I really love the bold direction of this book. I love the bold, um, sophisticated technique of the book. I really, really like this. Now, I'm not always sold on Cy Spurrier work. Sometimes it's, I find it a little overly challenging for me, um, and maybe that's all on me, but I usually like his stuff better on the reread. This first issue just blew me away right off the cuff. It's about these three outcast-feeling, alienated-type kids in high school. They all got their own things going on, um, their own mental struggles, their own lives to deal with. You got like a bully in there. You got all these other, this is the elements of high school, right? And so anyway, these three kids wind up in the woods together. They discover this alien artifact and, and being near it, all of a sudden now they share mental space. So they have like a mental telepathy with each other. They're all forced to communicate with each other and also feel what everybody else feels. So it kind of brings them together, even though at times maybe they don't want to do it. Great distinct characters with unique voices. Really liked this one. I really thought it was great. The lettering by Jim Campbell really helps um, 
technically in the story when you start having all these voices overlapping in one. It's got a great hooky ending that brings you right back from more. Chris Wildgoose and Andre May, fantastic artwork, a very crisp, clean, fresh, and dynamic style that really fits the tone of the book. And the writing was excellent. Great dialogue, great character, great setup. I love this. Cannot wait for more. It's a six-issue series. It's from Boom Studios, and it's my pick of the week. Anyway, that's what I thought about the comic books I read. What are your top ten? What's your top five? What's your top three? What are your favorite comic books of the week, or of the month, or of the year, or of all time? Let's talk about it in the comments down below. We really do appreciate you checking out the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe. If you want to support this channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash PCP, where you can unlock exclusive content and early access. Like early access hours before the video drops, the weekly comic book review every Tuesday night, a downloadable audio file is available to our patrons. You can sign up, like I said, patreon.com slash PCP. We really do appreciate everything. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.